So are we a thanksgiver or are we a complainer? Basically. And I just want you just to think about that. So if you've got a pen and paper, maybe write down your percentage, you know, do a bar. Which one is like which one which one it where is it? We want to change that because we're gonna talk about Thanksgiving. We're gonna talk about um, giving thanks to God, giving thanks to in life. And if we don't get that complaining bit lower, then we're really gonna to struggle to be giving thanks to God. Okay. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So these are a few scriptures that are um, in the word of God. So the word of God uh, is full of thanksgiving, full of it. Like loads and loads of giving thanks in the word of God. Okay, I've got about six. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admo admonishing, ab admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Colossians 3.16 Anyone ever think, why do we need to listen to worship? Why do we need to listen to praise? Why do we need to have these things in the car? Why can't we put the radio on? Why can't we have this stuff on? Because it brings out thankfulness in us. Because as we sing of the goodness of God, oh Jesus, you died on the cross. You're what a beautiful name it is. Whatever it might be, it rises something in us and we think, I'm so thankful for right now for who Jesus is and what God's done for me. Worship is so important. Singing, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, so important. It raises the level of thankfulness in us. Colossians 3.16 Do not be anxious about anything but in situ every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. Philippians 4.6 We're going to look at that passage in detail later on. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. 1 Timothy 4, 4 to 5. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Psalm 100, verse 4. And finally, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, 18. Give thanks in what? Give thanks in what? In all. In everything. Give thanks in all circumstances. No matter what you're going through, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. Sounds hard. Ben, if you could skip to the second, not the, not the go again and again. Brilliant. So we're going to start with complaining. We're going to start with complaining. So Exodus 16, 6, it says, Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. For he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what, we, what are we? So what he's saying is you're complaining and you think it's about it's us, but you're complaining against God. That you complain against us. Also Moses said, you shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. This is an exodus, right? I, I talk about this, these people a lot because there's such a lesson in the Exodus story. But God has done miracle after miracle after miracle to this point. Okay? He has brought them out of the land of Egypt. He's brought them out of slavery. He's done miracle to get them there. And yet, they're complaining. They're saying, why are we, why, what, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? God provides them with water. What are we going to eat? God's going to provide you with meat in the evening. He's going to provide you with supernatural bread in the morning. Do you know, even after this point, when God provides it, they complain, oh, we had manna yesterday. We had bread yesterday for breakfast. Why? Bread, bread, bread. It's supernatural. This isn't bread. It's not like a guy delivers it 
This is coming from heaven. And yet, they complain. And, and the scripture here says, the Lord hears your complaints. The Lord hears your complaints. And the word complaints is murmurings or grumblings. And um, in the dictionary, it says a statement that a situation is unsatisfactory or unacceptable, i.e., I intend to make an official complaint. I want you to think about this for one second. Because what challenged me was we're a bunch of immature people. That's what challenged me. In Christianity, we're immature. In our faith, in the world, we're immature. But in Christianity, there's too many immature Christians going around complaining to God. God. You know, we're talking about God. So what that means is it says G-O-D and then there's a full stop. It's not God, little G, and then there's something else. It stops with God. This is the creator of the universe, the beginning and the end. The author and the finisher of our faith. The architect of all things. Do we really have a relationship with God where he is that first? Because we do like the idea of father, that sounds like family. And we do like the idea of a savior that saves us. And we do like the idea of brother, I've got a brother. I like the idea of having a brother who calls himself God. Oh, that's amazing, that makes me God, doesn't it? We like the idea of bringing God to our level, but do we really understand where he really is? Do we really understand who God is? We've got to stop being immature in our faith and start having an attitude towards God that puts him on the throne before any of the other stuff. Before we say his father, before we say his uh, brother, before we say any of those things, do we really understand that he's the ruler? That he is God, he is judge? Do we really get that? Because we like the other stuff, but we've got to take every part of it. I think you've been learning this in, in your discipleship course, isn't it? That there's all these parts to God. Yeah? So we can't just take the bit we like. And actually, that's where false doctrine or dodgy doctrine comes out. Because someone takes one piece of God. I'll take, I'll take the, the Jesus is my brother bit. Or I'll take the God is my father bit. But we forget that he's on the throne. We forget the sovereignty of God. And we need to get that. We need to stop being a bunch of murmuring, grumbling so-and-sos. We've got to stop it. Because think about what you're doing when you really say that. It says this. A statement that a situation is unsatisfactory. I.e. I intend to make a complaint. If God was to walk in here in one minute's time, you're going to meet him face to face. Are you going to stand there and say, thank you, I'm so glad that you've turned up, Jesus. I'm so thankful that you're here right now. Um, grab a seat and let me tell you, um, I'm a little bit unsatisfied. I can't believe that this is the way that you've dealt my life and I'd like to make a complaint. We would not do that. So with God being where he is, which is everywhere, with God seeing all things, with, you can't go and hide from God. You can't say, well, if I go into a certain room and hide from God, he won't know what I'm doing or can't see what I'm doing. He does. We can't hide anything from him. He sees all things. So why do we treat God like that? With an immaturity and our attitude. So our attitude of complaining, oh, my job, oh, my relationships, oh, why have you dealt me this? Why have I got this? It's complaint. We're talking to God. But what we're really saying is, I'm really unsatisfied with what you've given me, God. And a lot of people that walk into the kingdom of God, they make a decision to follow Jesus because the story of Jesus dying on the cross is a story we all love. Oh, someone died for me. I could take that one. I like that story. I love that story. But what, what happens is we get this false idea and this false teaching that tells us that life's going to be good now because God's on our side. When life is still going to be the same, we're still going to face situations and sicknesses and relationship troubles and financial problems. We're going to go through similar, all sorts of problems that we would have had whether God was in our life or not. And so what we do is say, God, I know you died on the cross for me, but I would like to make a complaint because I thought there was like the next part of the deal was that, that you were supposed to do this, this and this, this and this for me. And we make a complaint about our Christianity. Why is God not doing this? Why is God not doing that? Why have you done this to me? Has anyone ever seen the film Bruce Almighty? See, Bruce Almighty is us. It's the church today that believes that God is this put on 
thing where we can just say to God what we want and we know better. And Bruce Almighty in this film, he just complains to God so much that God just has enough. Okay, so what God says is, all right, okay, I'll put you in charge for a day or a few days. And he doesn't even put him in charge of the world. He puts him in charge of a little town. And he still messes it up because he thinks he can do God's job. We think we can do God's job. We think God, we know better about ourselves than God who created us and designed us does. So we complain, and he complained, and then he messed it all up. There's a, one scene where he's so fed up of having to answer all these prayers, he just says yes to every email that's a prayer request. And then the next day, everyone's won the lottery, which means they all won about a dollar. Yeah, and it shows in it why we say, why won't you give me the, why won't you let me win the lottery? God says, because I see the whole picture. You surely should be playing the lottery in the first place, but, but like, God sees everything, doesn't he? This is why it can't be a yes to everyone's prayers. There's, there's, there's uh, consequences, there's situations, there's things that will come out of those things. See, we think we know better than God, and we don't. We really don't. We need to start trusting God with our lives because he knows best. And yet we're a bunch of grumblers. We're a bunch of moaners. We're moaning about life. We're, oh, do you know what I went through today? Oh, it's been a bit of a rubbish day today. There's no thanks. We don't thank God for what he's doing. I don't, we don't, do we hear from you? Do you hear from me enough thanks? Or do we talk about what's not right? What's not going right? So these guys were the pros of it. They were doing it thousands of years ago. We still do it today. These guys were the pros at complaining. And they had, I think personally, less reason to complain. Because God supernaturally did miracle after miracle in their lives visually, like it was there every moment. God said, I hear your complaint, so here you go. Here's some food. Like, to me, I'm like, you heard their complaint and you actually followed it through. You actually went and met their need because God was trying to show them. And it says later on, which we'll look at, what God was doing in the wilderness with them. They missed it. Their complaining caused them to miss the blessing of God. Not the, the their blessings from God, but they missed the promise of God. We need to change our attitude and we need to reprogram our minds to be one from complainers that looks at the negatives to be one that looks at the positives. Um, has everyone heard of the saying that for every one negative comment you need like 10 positives to outweigh that because we only remember the one negative? Think about that when we deal with each other. Think about that when you're dealing with people when they're walking in. If you're going to point out the negative, they're going to remember that over any positives that they've been said. It's going to take two, a lot of positives to override that. Because they're only going to think, oh, that's the one thing I'm rubbish at. That's the one thing I'm not good at. Why do we need to point out the negatives in people's lives? Why do we feel like we have to? Do we, need to? we don't need to. There's a difference if you're dealing with people in sin. There's a difference when you're dealing with people that, that, that the Word of God says we can come alongside and, and encourage where they're going down the wrong path. But I'm just talking about everyday life. Why do we even need to say anything negative to one another? Because that negativity is going to be used to, to cause that person to struggle or have a hard time, have a difficult day. We don't even know what they've gone through that day. And we've seen that situation happen many times in church where someone walked in and said something horrible and that person, it's been the worst time that they could have even said it. They should have never said it anyway. But it's been the worst time they could have done it. And it's caused people to struggle, caused them to struggle to give um, their ministry that they were going to do, all sorts of things. We need to cut it out. Okay, Daniel. So a law was passed to stop Daniel from praying and worshipping God. So Daniel ignored it and he gave thanks. And it says this, it says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he knelt down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before. Daniel 6 verse 10. You see, people were jealous of Daniel. He had favor with the king. And so they wanted to trap Daniel. So what they did is they went to the king and they said, King, if uh, you are surely the only people that should be worshipped is you. So why don't we set up a, 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 a law that means that they bow down to you and you alone and all other gods are, are um, wrong and if anyone does that, they should be put to death. And the king says, yeah, of course, because that's right. It should be about me, not about anything else. Um, and he was tricked into bringing this law in place. So it says this, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, what that means is when the law was passed, after it was already agreed, after that, the law that said that you, if you go ahead and worship God, you will be put to death. 
after that was put in place, so it was absolute law, Daniel went to his house and his windows being open in his chamber. So he didn't go into his house and say, okay, Lord, they're not listening. Our Father, who oh, art in heaven, I'll be your name. He, he went into his room. He opened his windows and he, three times a day, he praised and he thanked God. Thank you, God. Praise you, God. You're a mighty God. His windows were open. Everyone could hear him. Do you know why we know this? Because they heard him. Yeah? So he didn't hide it, but he says he did this three times a day and prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he did before. You see, he, whatever he was doing before, he did the same. Do we give thanks to God when it's all good? Oh Lord, thank you for the bank account amount that's in my bank right now. Thank you for the car that you've given me. Thank you for the family that you've given me. Thank you for my health. Like, oh, that's good. Then suddenly, the bank account's not looking so great. Suddenly, our health isn't so great. Suddenly, we've got a family feud going on. Things aren't so great anymore. If this was Daniel, it would say, he went and praised God, thanked God, just as he did before. But, but for us, do our circumstance dictate how and when we give thanks? Because God needs, we need to give God thanks. Where, what did it say? In all circumstances. We need to give God thanks in all circumstances. So Daniel has got favor with the king Praise God three times a day. Daniel now may die for his faith. Praise God. See, he doesn't change. Just as what he was doing before, he was still doing. He still praised God. He didn't shift his faith. His faith level didn't go up. It didn't go down. He just stayed the same because he gave thanks in his circumstance. I might die for this, but you're still worthy to be praised. My circumstance and my situation tells me that I am, I could, this is not a good situation to be in, but I'm not willing to put anything else above you, God. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Praise you. Praise you, God. Do we give thanks as we did before? Now I'm pretty sure all of you have got something in your head where you think, oh, I remember when God blessed me. Think about that moment. Think about that moment when God blessed you. Now think about a moment where it's been tough. Was, this, was the thanks the same? Was the acknowledgement of God and who he was and his sovereignty the same? Because Daniel says, no matter what your situation, your circumstance, praise and thank God just as you did before. Thank him just as you would, as if it was like blessing after blessing after blessing. Thank him in the difficult and the hard and the tough choices. And there's reasons for that, and we'll get to that in a bit. There are very few, if any, in the Bible who praise and thank God without first experiencing his faithfulness. But once they have the testimony of God's faithfulness, they will always have a reason to give thanks. You see, we don't blindly give thanks to God because he says, give me thanks. Why do we give thanks to God? Go on, question. Why do we give thanks to God? Yes. And we know, despite what our circumstances situation is right now, it might seem very dire, that he's still gonna do it again. And then we'll have another reason for his faithfulness in our lives. So God's faithfulness is so important to our praise. Now, I believe everyone in this room will have a testimony of God's faithfulness. Because if you're born again, if you've made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you already have it because it's the cross. God's faithfulness, we've received the message of the cross we don't need God to perform a miracle. We don't need him to heal our sickness or, or fix our bank account or do anything else. We've already got it. The reality is if you walk with God, he does that stuff for you. Those things work out. We see more of his faithfulness, more of his provision, more where he steps in. The more we surrender, the more he does. But we have a story. If you're not born again, then you have the word of God. Because the word of God is full of story after story after story after story of God's faithfulness. 
We just read it with Daniel. The story of Daniel is later on, he gets put in the lion's den. God protects him. And then the people that were trying to destroy him ended up getting fed to the lions themselves. God is faithful. Why? Because Daniel could have said, oh no, there's a law. I better not do what I did before because I might die. He didn't do that. He said, I'm going to carry on proclaiming and giving thanks to my God today, just as I would yesterday when the law gave me that freedom. And now the law doesn't give me that freedom. I'm going to still do it. And then God blessed that by actually giving getting his enemies, the ones that were trying to destroy him, to end up having the sentence that they were trying to put on him. But only because Daniel um, gave thanks. If Daniel had said, I better not, what would the story look like? What would have happened? It's only in God's faithfulness that we have a reason to give thanks. And we all have a reason to give thanks, but we end up with lots of reasons, I believe. If we really look back in our lives, we see God faithful in much of our lives and what he's done. Thanks comes from remembrance. We need to remember what God has done and we give thanks. Deuteronomy 6, 11, 13. And when you eat and are full, then take care else you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, it is the Lord your God you shall fear. This is a really important passage of scripture because what it's saying is, when you get everything you want, when what you think you need, i.e. fill your belly, fill your materialism, feed your flesh, whatever it is, because there's fleshly things that God can still feed, flesh isn't sin, It's what we do with the flesh that can lead to sin. So God can still meet those needs, yeah, in the flesh. But when you've got your full, when you're full of it, when you've got everything that you think makes you who you are, take care. Otherwise, you're going to forget God. Otherwise, you're going to forget the Lord. You see, sometimes we're praying for God to bless us. We're praying for God to do something. And when God does it, we completely start to forget him because we've suddenly got the thing that we always wanted. I've got what I've always wanted. I've got the prayer. I've got the answer. And sometimes that might be the very reason why God didn't want to give you a yes. And it says, because he brought you out of the land of Egypt and, he brought, and out of the house of slavery. He brought you out of the land of Egypt. He brought you out of the place of sin. That's where we can all relate. We've all been rescued from slavery. We've all been rescued from sin. We've all been rescued from the world. The final statement is, it is the Lord your God you shall fear. Going back to the beginning, do you really fear God? Do you really have a fear of who God is? It's not a scary fear. It's not an abusive fear. It's just a fear of like, God, I don't want to let you down. I don't want to let you down and I'm going to let you down, but I really don't want to let you down. I really don't want to let you down. And I really want to stop being a complainer to you because it's embarrassing actually. Because one day I'm going to face you and I'm not going to come with my complaints. I'm going to drop to my knees and give thanks. So why don't we start practicing it now on this earth? Why don't we start being a people of thanks rather than a people that complain? But it's embarrassing to think that's what we're like. When you really think, because what we're saying to God is, I'm complaining about the the lot you've given me. I'm complaining about what you've given me. I'm complaining about this life and these people and these situations and and, and my my job and my car and and all these things like, why can't I have better? Why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? You're complaining about these things, but you've been saved. The cross has saved you. You've been saved as, you don't need to be fed by those things. You just need to be grateful and thankful that you're saved. And everything else is just a bonus. If you end up with a clapped out car, it's better. That's a bonus, a blessing. I'm not looking at you, Lynn. Um, it's a bonus and it's a blessing it's a, because it's something out of nothing. I get to drive around. I get to be able to connect with people. I be able to network and drive from place to place. It doesn't matter what it is. Thank you, God, for what you've given me. And maybe, maybe if you have that kind of attitude, then maybe, maybe God might upgrade it. Maybe. I'm not saying that's a guarantee. I'm just saying maybe. Why is God going to do something for you when your attitude is complaint? When if you give thanks, then maybe God... Maybe God's got some kind of plan. He's a good father. Do, when God blesses us, when God gives us the answers to our prayers, when we do these things, 
Do we end up forgetting God? We heard Jess's testimony the other day where she said she had all these exes on, but those exes are often where she forgets God. Is that, yeah, is that fair to say? Because it's like, I've got the blessing, life's good, isn't this all, what it's all about? And then we lose sight of who God is. So we're all guilty of that. We've all got those exes in our lives, and those, most of those exes, well, Jess said it to her, her, herself, didn't you? Like, that's where I've taken my eyes off of God. That, why did I do it? Why did I do it? Well, God says, you've got to take care. Because when you get your fill, when you get full up, when you get the thing you want, you're going to forget me if you're not careful. Do we remember? Because what he's saying is, you need to remember that I rescued you from Egypt. Because if you forget, I'm going to have to take you through a process that's going to remind you of that. And God doesn't want to take us through that process because he's telling us here, don't do it, don't forget. But if you do, there might be a bit of a readjustment to get you back to the place of remembering me again. And in, in the same parts of Deuteronomy, I think it might be Deuteronomy 8, it actually says, if you don't do this, if you don't remember the things I've done, then you might end up in captivity, you might end up being in a place of slavery, which is exactly what actually happens to Israel because they forget God. And it says over and over, Israel forgot God. They forgot the way that His commands, they forgot His laws. And this is what in Deuteronomy God's saying, remember my laws, remember what Moses did, remember all these things, else you forget me. And then I have to do something different. And they have to go through these processes all the time. The whole reason Daniel is in the wrong place is because Israel messed up. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. We need to change our attitude and our perspective from who God says, um, from being one of complaint, from being one of negativity to one of God. I just thank you for who you are. I trust you. More, I trust you more in, than anything else. I trust you in all these things. I know what you've done before. I know you can do it again. But where is our attitude? Have we got an immature Christian attitude? You see, my, my relationship with God before I got saved um, was a very immature relationship with God. And that kind of did carry on into my Christianity for a bit. Because my, my, my kind of relationship with God, which was whatever God at the time, was one of, um, like, God... Uh, please help Manchester United win the football match. Manchester United didn't win the football match, so I'd get angry with God. I probably, when I was younger, I used to cry. You know, I'd be like, why would you do this? Why would you do this to me? Oh, what's happened? But when I was younger, that would carry into my relationship with God later on, because then it would be not football so much, but it would be other things. It'd be other things. We say, well, God, why have you done this, not done this for me? Why would you do this to me? Why? What, what's wrong with what's wrong? With, like, what's wrong with my life? Why have you given me these cards? Why did you deal me these cards? I remember meeting. People in, in church where people say this is just the cards that God has dealt me. But good luck with that pack. Like, what, what, what are you on about? You're, you're miserable and you're suffering and you're happy that God's telling that. Why don't you just give thanks? Why don't you give thanks because you might actually come out of those cards that you think God's dealt you. If you give thanks, stop complaining and moaning about God's just giving me this. It's miserable. It's miserable, but we love to complain rather than give thanks. Just finishing now, we're just coming up to the last passage. And, and the reason that giving thanks, having a heart of thanksgiving is key to everything is in this passage of scripture that we're just going to look at. It's in this passage of scripture. So tell me, did you feel like you learned something when we did about the voices? Put your hand up. Yeah? Did you learn something when we talked about the past and overcoming the labels of the past? Put your hand up. Yeah? Brilliant. Did you feel like last week when we talked about the the surrounding things that being in the place of fear or whatever that, that you understand if I can surrender to God he'll put me in a place of teaching to get me my victory do you, do you, do you get something out of that? okay now I'm going to give you the, the piece of the puzzle that allows all that to happen are you ready? okay so we're going to look at Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7 it says this be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. Do not worry. Do not get anxious. Why do we get anxious? Why do we have worry? Because we're worried about what we don't know. I'm worried that tomorrow could be like this. I'm worried that that person might say that or do this. I'm worried about 
Something I don't actually know is actually going to happen. I'm just assuming it will. We are anxious about life. We're anxious that we could get a doctor's note and say that we're sick. We, we, could get, we get anxious that suddenly some, um, our bank account can look very low. We're anxious about maybe Christmas is coming up, the pressure that comes with us. We get anxious and worried about provision for our family to make it look good because that's the pressure that's been put on us by the world. So we try to meet that standard. We can get anxious about all these things to try and meet people's needs or to, to try and become something. So we get anxious about everything. But the Word of God says, be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious in anything. Don't worry about anything. That's a hard thing, isn't it? Don't worry about anything. But instead, in everything. So don't worry about everything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. You see, it talks about prayer and it talks about thanksgiving. Do you, do you pray and thank God? Or do we pray, God, this is my list. So-and-so needs this, so-and-so needs that. It's like a Christmas list. So-and-so needs this, so-and-so needs that. That person needs a leg. That person needs uh, their healing over there. That person needs money. I need this, I need that. Is that the way that we speak to God? Because it does say that we can petition. Let your request be known to God. But there's a big key part and it says thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Why and how can we give thanks for something that God hasn't even done yet? It goes back to faithfulness. The faithful God. Because when we remember that God's been faithful, we can give thanks straight away in the fact that he can continue to be faithful. God says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He didn't suddenly say, oh, it's the year 2018. Everything's changing. Facebook's come out, Twitter's out. Now we've got this thing happening and that thing's happening. You know, maybe I need to go on Instagram and change the kind of God that I am. It's all a little bit different. So he doesn't change from that. He doesn't say, I'm a different God to what I was. It says very clearly what I was is who I am, and who I am is what I will be. So if God has done something for you, put your hand up if you feel God's been faithful to you in your life, then why can't he do it again? So when we petition to God, we petition with thanks. Because what we say to God is, God, I've got this circumstance right now, this situation, which you know, but I know that you can bring me through it because you've done it before. You've done it before, so you can do it again. So thank you, God, for the faithfulness of who you are. And thank you for, for, for who, who that you say that you are today. Not just then, but you are the same today. That, so thank you, God. Thank you, God, that, that this, this can happen. Thank you, God, that you hear my prayer. Thank you, God, for who you were and what you did in my life. Thank you, God, that that can happen again. We need to be a people of thanksgiving. We need to be a people that give thanks. But this is really key to the whole thing that we've been learning over the last three or four weeks. Let your request be known to God. And then there's this really important word. Has anyone heard of this word? And it says, and. You heard that word? The word and, have you heard that word before? Yeah, you might have learned it in school maybe. The word and. That word is actually kind of, and next, or then, so what it's saying is if you do this first, if you do this first, if you stop being anxious about things and trust me and then pray and ask me whatever your request is and you do it with thanks, next, then what will happen next is this. And next, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The peace of God that doesn't make sense because in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your sickness, in the midst of the mountain that's ahead of you, in the midst of the relationship that's breaking down, in the midst of your financial ruin, you have a peace that doesn't make sense. Does anyone understand that peace? Have people had that peace before? Yeah? So, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard 
your hearts and minds. It will guard your hearts and minds. Do you know I want to say something to you? Even though we give thanks to God because he's done it before and we know that he can do it again, the only guarantee of the answer of our prayer is not a yes to what we're asking, but is the peace of God. That's the guarantee. It doesn't say, let your request be known to God and he will answer every single one of them. It says, let your request be known to God and the peace of God, which doesn't make any sense, will guard your heart and your mind. You see, the guarantee is peace. The guarantee of the answer of all your requests, all your prayers, of laying down your anxiousness and your worry in life, is that God will give you peace. And that peace can only come through thanks. You can only get thanks through peace. You see, the way I looked at it was, God is faithful, we give thanks, he gives you peace. God gives you peace, we give thanks, he is faithful, he is faithful, we give thanks, he gives us peace. It's a cycle, it's a cycle. You see, we give thanks because he gives us peace. Then he is faithful, then he is faithful, we give thanks, and that thanks leads to peace. You see, if we look back over the weeks that we've done, how do we deal with the mind? How do we deal with the voices in our head? We need the peace. We need the peace to guard our mind. We need the peace to guard our mind because the voices are always gonna be there. You might get better at working out which one is which, but the voices are always gonna be there. But if you have given your prayer and your thanks to God and you have a heart that says, I'm a, thank I'm a thankful heart, I've got a thankful heart. I'm thankful for who you are and what you say I am. I'm not complaining about what you done or not done for me. I'm just thankful for who you say I am. I'm thankful for what you've done for me, regardless of what comes next, regardless of whether it's a yes or a no. I'm thankful God will give you the peace. So in the midst of the storm and the circumstances, which is usually what we're praying for, isn't it? God, why am I in this storm? Why is this going on? God says, in the midst of that storm, as you face that mountain, as there's no way through, if you give me your prayer with thanks, I'll give you the peace in that storm 